This week on Motor Week, Phil Sayer looks at the Alpha 145, Richard Hammond drives the stunning Noble M10, and we look at city cars with Howard Stapleford. Alfa Romeo have been very much in the news recently, and quite right too. The 156 is getting rave reviews, it's taken on the very best that BMW can offer and has sure given it a run for its money. Above that in the range, the 166, which has plenty of fans too. And if you've got loads of money and you only need two seats, then spend it on a GTV Coupe or the very desirable Spider convertible equivalent. Now with all that stuff going on, I guess a lot of people have forgotten about the baby of the range. Here it is, the 145. There's a booted version with a couple of extra doors too, the 146, essentially the same car. I think the 145 looks pretty indeed, and this one is the Cloverleaf, which means it's got the two-litre engine, twin spark, too many spark plugs, and it goes like stink. That basically is what Cloverleaf means in alpha speak. Are they right? Let's find out. Any car with sporting ambitions has got two key ingredients. A great engine, okay, full marks there, a tick in the box. This engine is fantastic. It needs to be revved fairly hard to get the best out of it. There's not a lot of torque if you don't rev the thing. Uh, but the suspension is the other key component. Now, suspension and ride is always going to be a compromise between how well it holds the road and how comfortable it is. And I think they've actually got the sums a little bit wrong. It's too soft, and that means that it just doesn't hold on quite as well as it might do around the corners, and doesn't actually feel like a sports car. It's too soft. It's almost too comfortable. Now, would you actually want to own one? What's for and against? Well, perhaps the big four is the fact that it is a great little package. It's an enjoyable car overall, and very, very capable. However, against it is towering depreciation, like virtually all Italian cars in this country suffer from. Also, the fuel economy isn't anything to write home about. It likes to drink, this vehicle. And the JD Power Reliability Survey put this car a rather sad 82nd. Now, everybody that was questioned praised its performance. The whole package, they said, was pretty right. But niggling electrical faults, minor paintwork blemishes and problems, all that kind of stuff that other manufacturers, notably the Germans and, fair play, the Brits, do seem to have sorted out now. The Italians apparently have still got some way to go on that. For my money, this is one very good-looking hatchback car. That grille is a kind of a miniaturized version of the approach of styling that you'll see on the bigger Alfa Romeos. And when we look under the bonnet, well, what do you expect to find? It's not exactly a Morris Minor in there, is it? Beautiful-looking Alfa Romeo twin-spark engine, writ large. That'll certainly impress the neighbors when you're checking the oil. And by the way, good access for all the things that you need to have access to, like checking the oil and the water, etc. As you move around the car, the big disappointment for me is these alloy wheels. Now, I really think they could have done better. It's like a sort of a five-hole version of the old XR3i wheels from the days of our youth. This side treatment is nice with the swept-up line here in the door. And these doors are huge. That's great for access. It does, however, mean that this B-pillar is a fair way back, and that means a big stretch over your shoulder to get the seat belt. But we have to compromise, I guess. These side windows, just the overall approach of that I think is interesting. These open, by the way, for a bit of extra ventilation. But it's when you come round to the back of this vehicle that I think the stylist really has earned his money. With that unusual and quite brave sort of V approach there, the spoiler on the top says, I mean business, so does the Boy Racer exhaust, and above all, so does the Cloverleaf badge in conjunction with the Alfa Romeo badge. This car says, I'm not playing around here. The interior is in many ways pretty much what you'd expect from a car with sporting pretensions. Lots of black and red piping on everything. The seating position is peculiar, it has to be said. I always figure with a sporty car you need to be well back from the wheel, legs nice and straight. But this seat doesn't lend itself to that. Although it cuddles you here nicely at the sides, there's a high front lip. Now what that means is that you have to be quite close to the pedals with your legs almost at a right angle here. 
Okay, that's fine, except that Alfa Romeo then very thoughtfully give you a little handle to pull at the side, which will take this seat even higher. Have I disappeared yet? Now, who on earth needs to be that high in a car? I certainly don't, that's for sure. Now, it does give a lot of extra legroom in the back if this seat is further forward, and maybe that is the point of the exercise. Rear legroom, by the way, is quite generous. This is what I don't like. Not enough bells and whistles on the dashboard. The radio is in completely the wrong position because it's very fiddly anyway, and it shouldn't be down there. It needs to be up here. But above all, all of this plastic just seems a little bit too cheap and cheerful for me. The switch gear is a little bit on the flimsy side and it works today, but will it work next year? Who knows? But really, this ventilation system here, I think they need a good rethink on that one. So, the Alfa Romeo 145 2-litre Cloverleaf on the road price, 16742 Now that sets it up against the BMW 318i Compact, which will cost you around 50 quid more. And for another 100, you can have the Audi A3 1.6 Sport. A little below it, 20 quid less, the Nissan Primera 2-litre SLX. Oh, and by the way, if you really want to spend serious money on an Alfa, how about the new Alfa GTV 6-speed 3-litre? A mere £30,000 and 65 pence. That two-litre engine pumps out 155 brake horsepower, enough to take the Cloverleaf from 0 to 60 in 7.8 seconds, which is pretty seriously quick. There's a price to pay, though. The fuel consumption a mere 32.1 mpg. That's not terribly good. And the insurance is Group 14. Top speed, 131 miles per hour. If you really want an Alfa Romeo, my recommendation would be save up your money and get one of this car's bigger brothers. Because, in a sense, it's a victim of its own success at the moment, Alfa Romeo, and because of that, this car really doesn't match up to the rest of the range. Now, that said, that doesn't mean it's a bad car. It isn't. It's a very good car. And to be honest with you, I have thoroughly enjoyed driving it. In fact, I think I'll do a bit more of that. Some months ago, Jeannie Buckley drove the prototype Noble M10. Back then, the car had Ford's 1.8-litre ZTEC engine, and we concluded that the little sports car showed a great deal of promise. Lee Noble promised us a V6 version, and that the production M10 would impress us even more. And it does. External changes are minimal. Mostly, they add a touch of aggression with spoilers at the front and back. But the biggest changes are reserved for under here. So it's out with the old 1.8 litre ZTEC engine to be replaced by Ford's 2.5 litre V6 Duratec engine. And that means 170 brake horsepower in a car that was never exactly slow in the first place. And it's a good job that that engine is so compact, because behind it there's still enough room left for what is quite a substantial boot. And I'd say there's about room in there for you and the other half suitcases if you set off for a nice weekend in your natty sports car. What else does one do? Of course, if we're going to do that sports car thing, let's do it properly. We need the wind in our hair feeling, and it's not difficult here. Two catches, and a flip, and that's it. Don't let anybody try and impress you ever again by saying, oh, our automatic hood mechanism takes only 10 seconds. It takes about one and a half seconds with this thing. And then we come to the interior. There have been major changes in here, but you've got to bear in mind it is a handmade, custom-built car, so it can be to your exact specifications. If you want wood and leather everywhere, that's what you get. If it's vinyl and lino that does it for you, then that's what you can have as well. But overall, it feels very well made, very well put together, and actually pretty upmarket in here. It's comfortable, spacious, and feels very solid. And then we get to the best bit, the drive-in bit. away and the first impression is that it feels quite docile. The clutch is actually quite light and feels really, if anything, rather pedestrian. But bury that long travel throttle and all of a sudden you hear the V6 bellow and then it really gets going. With 170 brake horsepower there are more powerful cars on the road. But it's nothing to do with what's written on paper. The fast car is all to do with how it applies that power to the road. And in the case of the Noble M10 we've got the most delightful light steering, incredibly sensitive. It's real fingertip driving, even at high speeds, every tiny little input is rewarded with a response from the car, and the car in turn talks back to you, feeding back through the steering every little bump. You've then got the joy, of course, of it having that mid-engine balance and rear-wheel drive configuration, which means you can absolutely balance it on the throttle through even the tightest of corners. This car is enormous fun to drive at silly speeds. The likes of Lotus had really better watch out.
Now, you might be thinking that it's just another specialist sports car manufacturer trying to get a foothold in an already crowded marketplace, but there are some compelling reasons to consider the Noble M10. It's all in the details. For instance, the way the door shuts with a satisfyingly expensive thunk. That's the kind of trick you might expect from Mercedes or BMW, but not from a small specialist sports car manufacturer, and yet there it is, music. Ah. And so, the price. Well, it'll set you back around about £34,000, which puts the M10 into very much Porsche Boxster territory. Having said that, with an anticipated annual production rate of between 50 to 100 M10s, you'll be guaranteed the kind of exclusivity that Porsche owners can really only dream about. And the M10 is more than practical enough to be used every day, which was Lee Noble's original brief to himself. In fact, Lee's only problem is that the potential buyer haven't heard of either him or his company. As for his car, well, no, that's more than good enough. Motorweek News. Toyota has become the first car manufacturer to win the Global 500 Award for Environmental Initiative. The United Nations Environmental Program, or UNEP, recognized Toyota for making the environment a corporate-wide priority. Not only is the firm producing cars such as the Prius with its innovative hybrid powertrain, but is committed to meet and surpass ISO 14001 environmental standards at all its plants by year-end. With car manufacturers constantly targeted by the environmental lobby, it's initiatives such as this which other manufacturers must seek to emulate. Good news for buyers interested in Rover's new 75. The Association of British Insurers have rated the new model a two-point advantage over most of its key competitors. The 1.8 and 2.0-litre classic models start at Group 8E, with the highest rating going to the Club and Connoisseur 2.5 models at 14A. In Part 2, Howard Stableford looks into city cars. Eventually, if Gordon Brown has his way, we'll all be pottering around in cars, yay big. Noddy cars, your mum's shopping trolley, call them what you will, but these economic and affordable mini cars could well be the future for the hard taxed motorist. But would you like to be seen in one? Let's put three of the leading contenders to the street cred tests. With the Chancellor continuing to pile taxes on the price of petrol whilst reducing taxes on the running costs of these small cars, they start to make a great deal of sense. But once you've shelled out your seven or eight thousand pounds, what will they be worth a few years down the line? After three years and 36,000 miles, we think that the Seat Arosa will be worth around 55% of its original costs. It's a high build quality, VW parts, and since you can run it on short change, you'll be getting quite a large lump of your money back at the end of it. Not quite the same for the Fiat Seicento. We think about 40 to 45% after three years. The build quality is not quite as good, and these orange parts and the grey might start to look a bit tatty after three years. Now, traditionally, the Deus don't do well in the second-hand car market. Some people don't feel comfortable that there's no distributor backup. But because we think these cars are going to become increasingly popular in the future, there's going to be a strong niche market, and we do think they'll sell well. And this one, again, about 40 to 45% of your original costs. Next, it's the TARDIS test. These cars are designed to feel bigger on the inside than they look from the outside. But do they? And even if there's plenty of space in the front, what are the implications for legroom and storage space in the back? The Seat Arosa passes the TARDIS test well. There's loads of headroom space up here, and the feeling of space is really helped by the acres of glass. Huge windscreen here, and look at the size of the door windows too, which really gives it a nice, airy, bright feel to it. Now, the driving position's comfortable, but I'm, what, 5 foot 10, and already the seat is all the way back. So, what must it be like sitting back there? It's not very comfortable, actually. There's nowhere to put my knees. Well, as you'd expect on cars this size, there's hardly any boot space whatsoever. Barely enough to put a couple of heavy shopping bags. 
but they are all flexible and the Arosa is no exception because the back seats flip forward so that you can actually extend the back space if you need to. The Seat Arosa has just about as much interior space as the VW Polo and this configuration is probably the most practical way of using it. The Seicento also has reasonable head clearance for someone of average stature like myself and the feeling of light and space here is helped by a small sunroof up here but it's a bit fussy and I don't particularly like the way that you open and close it with this twist wheel which is all a bit fiddly. There are plenty of places to put things but I think the design is lazy and rather ugly. Look at this great big grey bucket affair. You can throw lots in but it's all going to slide around. And if we thought that the legroom in the back of the Arosa was small, just take a look at this. What's he talking about? There's loads of space back here. Until you pull the seat down. <laughs> if you're offered a, a ride in the back of one of these, remember that the bus can sometimes be a better alternative. Grief. Boot space, small, about the same size as the Arosa, but again, the back seat has the split fold arrangement. So with one half down, well, you can get a tiny passenger in the back and you're weak shopping. And if you put both sides down, well, it's not a bad little space, actually. The Matiz is slightly narrower than the other two, and yet it still has the feel of a much bigger car. And that, I think, is due to the design of the front. The sloping windscreen means that you can't actually see the front of the bonnet. And there's this huge console area up here with loads of space, which reminds me of an MPV. And looking at the back, well, the seats look larger and more substantial than the others. And there does seem to be a bit more leg room. And look at this, tiny cars can still have four doors. The Deumet is, is the winner of our TARDIS test because the back seat feels like a proper one and although there's not a great deal of legroom, it's better than the others. Now all three claim to be five-seaters. Look, there are three seat belts in the back here and we think that's rather optimistic. There's no way you get three adults in the back of any of them comfortably. In the back, split-fold rear seats, of course, and the boot space well, if anything, it's marginally bigger than the others. You just might be able to squeeze that extra carrot into your shopping. Apart from fuel economy, another great benefit of small cars is that you can park them easily. You can squeeze them into spaces that those big cars just have to pass by. So let's put that to the test. This is the Seicento. Reasonable visibility through the mirrors here so that you can see what's actually happening behind you. And this one doesn't have power steering. So that makes it just a little bit heavier to handle. But let me see how I do here between the other two. Good turning circles on all three cars too, and that helps. Ah, easy, no problem at all. The Deo Matiz is the one that really feels like you're driving a much bigger car because there's so much space in here compared with the Fiat. But the fact that it feels like a big car is quite disconcerting because it certainly doesn't drive like a big car. It's only got 800 cc's. It's much more sluggish than the Fiat, so don't think you're going to beat many people off the lights. Very conservative styling here at the front, and I'm also a bit dubious about the gear shifts. I think when you're changing up and down, sometimes you're not sure whether you're in third gear or first, so that's a bit sticky, I think. Oh, and one last thing about the hopelessly underpowered engine. It sounds horrible. What do you think? Listen to this. Engine? Or bicycle dynamo? Of the three, this, the sporty little Fiat Seicento, is the one that most reminds me of driving inside a go-kart. Right down to this small leather-clad steering wheel, which is quite good fun, and the fact that it doesn't have power steering. It has a really good turning circle, this car, but you have to work quite hard with it. Here in the city, it's extremely nippy. Despite the fact that it's only got a, an 1100 engine, you really can streak away from the lights with the quickest of them. Now, I know earlier I was critical of the 
buckets, these storage areas which are rather grey and boring, but on the other hand, look at the styling of all these funky little knobs and dials. Look at that RPM gauge, it's absolutely gorgeous popping up there. Its Achilles heel, I think, is road noise, even at this speed. 30 miles an hour, you can quite clearly hear the noise of the tyres on the road. And of course, as you get faster onto the open roads, then that noise gets really very loud indeed, and you have to crank up the radio in order to concentrate on it. The Seat Arosa has an unusual piece of styling, which I quite like. You know how picky we all are about the colour of our car, and then we spend most of our time sitting inside it, not noticing what colour it is at all. Well, as you can see, Seat have actually brought a lot of the exterior colour inside. It's unusual, and I think it works really well. Now, this car has the largest engine of the bunch at 1.4, but interestingly, it also has marginally better MPG figures. So, in terms of power and efficiency, I'd say this is the car to go for. And also, because that engine is slightly bigger, it performs best of the three out on the motorway. I drove this up from London last night, and uh, 200 miles, I suppose, and although the road noise gets quite high, it was quite a comfortable journey. However, at the end, of course, I got out and just had to shout at everybody because I couldn't hear a thing. Hello! Nice to see you! Sorry I'm a bit deaf! Road noise on the motorway! That sort of thing. These cars are nippy, well-styled, fun, and at a third of the cost of an A-Class, they've got to be well worth looking at. The Seat Arosa, it's comfortable and quick. The Fiat Seicento has fantastic manoeuvring abilities. And the Deu Matiz with its dual airbags and air conditioning is our winner today. If you're looking to beat those motoring taxes, think small. Next week, Ian Royal tests the GTI version of Peugeot's 206, and Ken Gibson drives a Jeep Wrangler, not in familiar surroundings like this, but in a location you'd never believe. <laughs>